Greetings from the people of planet Earth. Democracy Cast from Democracy Watch News. Democracy Cast is available wherever you access your podcasts. You can also hear it at TuneIn Radio. Check out the website where you'll find links to our podcasts and blogs. DemocracyWatchNews.org. Greetings from the Hi, I'm Mark Taylor Canfield, Executive Director for Democracy Watch News. This is our international press briefing on the COVID-19 public health crisis in the United States. Participating in this briefing are John Harvey in Pittsburgh, Sally Gellert in New Jersey, Dean Edwards and Steve Barnes in Oregon, myself in Seattle, and two guest callers from India. This is Sally Gellert. And Sally Gellett is in New Jersey, in Bergen County. Sally, what is happening in Bergen County in terms of the COVID virus, and what information do you have today? Almost everything is shut down, essential businesses only, uh, no personal gatherings, um, shelter in place. Our Bergen County Jail has the first ICE uh, prisoner tested positive for the COVID-19 virus, is in... uh, isolation or quarantine there in the jail. A lot of the New Jersey immigrants have been transferred up to Batavia, we learned recently. They're apparently using extra space in the jail to keep people instead of dorms in cells, which some uh, have complained that it amounts to virtual solitary confinement. There is going to be a car caravan protest outside the Bergen County Jail tomorrow afternoon. The grocery stores, I believe, are still open. Uh, I know our local shop rights are not delivering, but there are services available that will do shopping for elder folks who are shut in. One of the stores has early morning senior hours. Kind of wonders if you get too many seniors, is that any better than too many other people? But at, they're trying it. There is a great campaign uh, rally for restaurants. If you buy a uh, restaurant gift card through Toast, they for the first something like 250000 they donate a dollar to food service charities. This is Mark Taylor Canfield in Seattle, Washington. Martin Luther King Jr. County was one of the first counties in the United States hit by the COVID virus. There have been 111 new confirmed cases, 2,580 cases, including 132 deaths although these numbers are changing every day. Martin Luther King County's own Wednesday data, which was yesterday, showed it still has the bulk of Washington's cases with 1,359 people infected and 100 people dead. One of the latest reports from the state shows that there's an 843% week-over-week increase in claims for unemployment benefits this week as businesses started to temporarily close under state-mandated orders to slow the spread of the coronavirus. So according to uh, Cairo 7 News in Seattle, uh, the numbers released Thursday by the U.S. Department of Labor, which I've confirmed, is is that uh, the Employment Security Department showed 133,464 new claims for unemployment benefits uh, over the uh, week of March 15th to the 21st, an increase of 120,000 new claims over the previous week. And at a press conference, uh, Governor Jay Inslee said uh, today that this is a, going to be a huge trench that we're going to have to get over. And employment security has been averaging between 13,000 and 25,000 phone calls every day to its claim centers. That comes from spokesman Nick Demarest. Uh, in the first week of March, it was between 1,400 and 2,500. He said that during business hours, the agency's website has averaged 3,000 concurrent users every day since last Tuesday. 
So there's a major economic crisis in the United States. There's a major economic crisis in Washington State due to the COVID virus. Governor Jay Inslee on Monday of this week ordered a stay at home for all Washington residents. All non-essential businesses have been closed. There are guidelines that the governor has set out. There's been a civil emergency declared in Washington state since very early in this crisis. Governor Jay Inslee of Washington state and uh, Mayor Jenny Durkin of Seattle were one of the, the first two public officials to call civil emergencies because of the situation. And as of right now, the governor is asking people to stay home unless you absolutely have to go out. Although he does recognize that, you know, hiking, walking, taking your dog for a walk, getting some fresh air at the park is also an essential part of physical and, and mental health. So people are allowed to do that, but he's asking everyone to keep a six foot distance from everyone around you. More of this social distancing. So we are in a, a center for activity in the COVID. We were one of the first parts of the country to deal with this problem. And uh, it is an ongoing situation with breaking stories every hour. So it's been um, kept a lot of journalists very busy. Now, a lot of people are not going to work. The non-essential businesses are not open right now. So a lot of people are staying home trying to find things to do with their time. The public schools have been closed for a couple of weeks now, and the original order for that was a six-week closure, although there is talk now in other parts of the country to maybe just keep the public schools closed until next fall. As far as what it's like to be in Seattle, we are lucky to have some very proactive and progressive um, representatives in our government. Um, Pramila Jayapal, our our congressional representative from Seattle has been in a numerous town hall meetings with Senator Bernie Sanders and others with uh, health professionals talking about how people can keep themselves safe and what we need to do as a community to keep from spreading the virus. Um, according to Governor Inslee, the essential businesses uh, are determined largely using federal guidelines. So they include emergency services, healthcare industries, critical manufacturing, child care services, food and agriculture, transportation, financial services, defense industries, and critical local government operations, including the courts. Now, some restaurants are still open, but they're only allowed to offer takeout and delivery services. Of course, the media and news journalists are allowed to operate as well. The governor stated during his address, quote, the media has just been absolutely critical to keep all of us informed about this virus, unquote. There is a lack of basic necessities, including toilet paper, hand sanitizer, rubbing alcohol, uh, latex gloves and surgical masks. Of course, first priority is being given to first responders and medical industry workers. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal announced couple of days ago that she was able to procure 4,000 more surgical masks from the port of Seattle. So regional and local governments are coordinating together on these efforts and trying to make sure that the supplies are there for the medical technicians. Unfortunately, uh, there are nurses, doctors, and medical workers who are uh, reporting that items are unavailable to them. I don't know how many. I don't have any of that information. The governor's two-week prohibition, which began on Monday of this week, is a prohibition on all public gatherings, including funerals, weddings, and religious services. But Governor Inslee made it clear that it's, people are still, of course, allowed to go out and, and hike or bike and get some fresh air. Most people are staying home. Now, we have issues when a civil emergency is declared and government officials are given extensive powers. And so we're hoping, of course, from a Democratic Republic point of view, that this is a temporary situation because it's not a comfortable thing to have your governor making decisions about your personal daily life and telling people that they cannot hold funerals, weddings, etc. He is kind of stepping close to the lines of separation of church and state. But I think in general, people feel that we all have a stake in this. And it's very important that we all try to cooperate with public health officials, that these are reasonable requests 
and that we're all willing to make those sacrifices in the name of public the public welfare. Um, the, the economic problem in Washington State is being addressed by local government as well, and I can report that the city government, the city of Seattle, the mayor's office, and the city council have set aside funds to assist small businesses with grants, and they've also set aside some, there's been a group of people who have set aside some funds to help artists, musicians, dancers, uh, actors, people who have been in the entertainment and arts who are not getting any work in Seattle right now because Seattle is very much an arts and music sort of culture. So those grants can be accessed through the city of Seattle's website and also through the state of Washington website. There is a coronavirus .wa.gov website for all residents of Washington State who are looking for information. Uh, so there is a, a specific website set up by the state of Washington to, to address these concerns and is constantly updated. One more thing I can report quickly here is that local national public radio station at the University of Washington, KUOW, has announced that they uh, will refuse to air any of the White House uh, Coronavirus Task Force um, uh, meetings pub or hearings or uh, press conferences uh, publicly because they feel that there's a lot of information that is um, going out from those press briefings that are unvetted, that have not been verified, and also include a lot of exaggeration. So KUW has announced that they will continue to report on the White House task force and their announcements, but they will be vetting the information before they release it to the public. It's very, very important now for journalists, uh, editors, publishers across the country, producers across the country to make sure that all of the information that we are sharing with the public is accurate, is cleaner, and accurate, that people do understand what's happening, what the latest updates are, and uh, we must be very, very careful not to repeat information <coughs> which is inaccurate. Uh, that's the situation here in Seattle, in Washington State, and Martin Luther King Jr. County, which has been an epicenter for this uh, I can't really uh, during his uh, public address this week where he did a good job of alarming, you know, sending, sounding out the alarm, sounding the alarm for what people need to do to stop the spread of this or slow the spread of this virus. But he also did a very good job of not panicking people and, and made it very clear that people should not be hoarding so just stick to their normal routine of shopping that the, the shelves will not be empty of these items. I don't know if that's true or not. I can't verify that, but I can quote the governor who himself quoted Walt Whitman from the poem Song of Myself. And the last thing that he said during his address was, of the current and present times and all times, be of good cheer. We will not desert you. I believe was his way of saying that our, our state, city, county, and um, state representatives and government representatives in Washington State are doing everything they can at this point to protect the public health. And they're on the job 24-7 as I speak. And I, from all indications, I see that that is true. This is Mark Taylor Canfield reporting for Democracy Watch News in Seattle, Washington. <clears throat> and John has a one-up. Yeah, good job, Mark. Good job. Here in Pennsylvania, we're seeing some very similar things to what you described. Unfortunately, Pennsylvania is being hit rather hard. And when we look at workers filing for unemployment benefits, it's increased by 2,000% over the last week. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Right now, we have 1,687 cases of COVID-19, but only three deaths. You know, and I've mentioned this before, I have worked on various projects. One that has come to mind recently was a project called Survive the Event, where, you know, this was coming and is going to continue to come. It's 
it's a uh, it's part of evolution. Viruses exist. Viruses will try to kill human beings. We need to be aware of these things. And you know, I'm I'm so disappointed in the fact that initially this was downplayed and man it, it's it's really sad that we didn't take it seriously and now we're scrambling to do our best you know i mean as a child i i've spent you know months i think in quarantines one way or another because traveling from one country to another um you know, in those days, back in those days, people took these diseases seriously. Um, you know, I mean, most diseases, I think people have become complacent because disease, you know, we, we've uh, prided ourselves on having cured pretty much every disease, well, not cancer and things like that, but, um, you know, we have inoculations for polio, et cetera, et cetera. So we're a little complacent, and here we are. It's been interesting. I've been driving around. I've been going to various grocery stores and seeing stuff disappearing off the shelves. One of the things that hit me the most was pet food. I have two cats, and well, actually not only pet food, but cat litter um, in short supply. Yeah, you know, hand sanitizer is just, uh, forget it. Um, I was lucky that I ordered some alcohol from Amazon. Probably got the last couple of bottles of that. But, you know, here we are. It's like... We're all sitting inside waiting, and um, the governor is suggesting that people only shop once a week. It's a, it's a ghost town, right? and you know the economy is going to take a major hit from this. It's it's going to be uh, well. We'll see. I mean, we can't predict what's going to happen. I'm mean, looking at China. It appears that this virus doesn't persist, but you know, I still don't know how accurate the information that we're getting from China is. And if, if you know, Italy is a different story. Um, New York City looks bad. You know, these are early days. I mean, in the next 10 days, we're going to really see what is going to happen. Check. I do have a couple of responses to what John was saying. That, I mean, there is a personal response to this as well. I'm a journalist, so I'm trying to be professional and just report the facts, man, as they say in, in the old Dragnet episodes. But, you know, we all have a personal reaction to this. And, yes, I can report that um, – you know, I haven't left my apartment for two days, but the last time I was out a couple of days ago, there was a, it was a ghost town. I'm, I'm in the center I'm, uh, of Seattle, in one of the most densely populated neighborhoods north of San Francisco, and there was almost no one on the street. So there were people in cars. I mean, stopping traffic in the United States is, is you know, almost impossible, but so there were people driving, not as much traffic uh, um, of course, and, and, and strangely, not many people coming into the city, but a lot of the people leaving, um, probably, you know, because they live in the suburbs and, and they're just coming in to get supplies or something and then getting out of the city. Um, living in a highly populated area <clears throat> is, um, one of the dangers of, of epidemics. It's one of the things that contributes to epidemics, um, people's proximity to each other, um, so it is unusual to, to walk around in Seattle and not see people out. Um, Seattle tends to pride itself on its, you know, mu music clubs like the Showbox Theater, Numos, the Crocodile. These are, you know, renowned music venues that are completely closed. Um, this 
there are two aspects of the story that I see as a journalist. One is there's the public health crisis, which is a life and death situation, life or death situation, the and very serious. And then there's also another very serious situation, which is the economic collapse. And um, I don't know how people are going to pay their rents. I don't know. I mean, I'm getting, I'm trying to stay in communication with family and friends. And what I'm hearing is that in some parts of the state which are quite rural and they haven't quite had as serious of an infection rate yet um people are staying home but there are a lot of small businesses and farmers and people who are still able you know to continue to do their work also a shout out to all of the grocery store workers the pharmacy workers the medical industry workers the communications and um, transportation workers I have a friend who, you know, works for the Department of Transportation in Seattle, and he's still out there working on the trains, keeping them going, because transportation is considered a major important part of the infrastructure and an essential um, industry to, as far as the governor's order is concerned. Um, but there are people out there that are are still working, and they're still interacting with people, and they're very courageous to anybody in the healthcare industry right now is doing a major heroic job in a, in a city like Seattle. And I, I just can't imagine they're like soldiers at this point. So, um, that moves me emotionally uh, as a member of the community. I know that people are communicating with each other in a way that maybe haven't in the past that people are checking in with each other and trying to be as helpful. And, and, and there's a sense of solidarity that I haven't seen in a while. Um, that's bringing people together in a real sense of community where we really all feel like we're a part of this now. Nobody is left out. Although there are, you know, millions of homeless folks across the country who have no health care at all and um, get left out of, of every major crisis and this one including. But in Seattle, there are some efforts to make sure that homeless folks um, are tested and that there's some assistance. Now imagine the, the social workers and people, the medical health care workers who are out there working with them and the, and, and the risk they're putting themselves uh, under, but they are heroes, and um, there is a commitment here to um, try to try to address the situation that you know. Just like a lot, of, this is just my editorial comment. A lot of these issues should have been dealt with a long time ago. John is completely correct. You know, the women's march in Seattle was canceled in February because of this, and nobody was paying attention. And even the media here just kind of you know wrote it off to I don't know you know. And it really, they, they, people should have been paying attention. The people that were organizing those marches saw it coming, and other people saw it coming. And John, you were warning us about it, you know. So there were people who saw it coming. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have a good response from our political representatives, and so we're playing. As Governor Inslee admitted, we're now it's a race against time because um, we need to make these medical facilities available to people. That's why they're calling in the National Guard and, you know, parts of the military because they have the expertise in setting up uh, literally, you know, like mash tents and things. So um, the, the issue there is that they want to make sure that there are enough facilities for people who are not just uh, suffering from the virus and, and also imagine all of the other people out there who have physical illnesses and now are afraid to go to the doctor because they think that the healthcare industry is overwhelmed already and they're worried, you know, that their health issue is not as important. Well, you know, there's still a lot of people with other acute issues out there that need to be treated. So we need the, the, the beds, we need the facilities. And in order not to be overwhelmed by the COVID cases, which they expect, um, that means portable uh, mobile facilities. And that's what they're working on right now. And I know our congresswoman from Mila Jayapal is working on that, trying to help set up these facilities, which... She is not, I noticed, not calling hospitals because that's, you know, that's a designation of a, of a, of a building, but, but they're mobile medical facilities. Um, and as far as the, the way that people are reacting to it personally, now, there are a lot of musicians in Seattle, of course, a lot of bands. You know, the joke here is that everybody and their mother and their brother is in a band. And so people have been doing online concerts, and that's how everyone has been reacting to this. The, the artists are performing online. Maybe it's just the band. There's four or five of them. Maybe it's just a solo performer, like uh, my friend Jim Page was one of the first I noticed to start an online concert series here. And people are looking for something to do. They're at home. They're not leaving. And so online activity has become a major focus, um, although that was already sort of becoming a major focus of our society. It's now even 
more of a focus during these times. So um, there have been a lot of online seminars, webinars, gatherings. I was even invited to an online birthday party for some folks who are in the arts and music. Um, oh, very cool. Very yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah, so people are being as creative as they can in order to stay in touch and communicate with each other. And personally, I know that even though as a journalist, my my work has not slowed down at, in the least. In fact, I'm probably more busy. Um, but I am making sure that I get plenty of rest, that I sometimes just sleep and don't answer the phone and try to block everything out. Because I think, you know, you cannot stay on this 24-7. Just like you learn as a journalist, you cannot, uh, you know, you cannot be thinking about politics 24-7. It will bring you out. The same thing with this. And occasionally, people just need to watch a movie, read a book, go for a walk, do something that con they consider normal. And, and try to, as Jay Inslee said, you know, keep keep your courage up and have faith. Um, because um, if everybody does the right thing, we can at least mitigate some of some of the um, causes, you know, some of the results of this. But I, I kudos to all the people that are trying to do things online. And I'm doing much more music now. I was trying to work on a recording studio anyway. So I find that now since I'm not performing in public or doing any kind of public reporting, like I'm not reporting on any of the political campaigns or city council meetings or hearings about the show box or any of this. So I have more time now when I'm not doing journalism about COVID to actually do some music and some writing. And I'm actually working with some classical musicians who have offered me, this is interesting too, musicians are now working online together. So there are several websites that I know of where people can actually perform in real time together online and collaborate and for a long time there have been websites like, like Endava where people have been remixing each other's work and sharing each other you know sharing samples with each other I even helped remix um the Nine Inch Nails guy you know Trent Reznor's uh track with his wife uh that he did at one point so there's a lot of that and what I found is some classical musicians and I'm very moved right now to write a piece about the COVID virus and and how people feel at the moment because I think Catharsis is important. It will help other people. Oh, it will help myself deal with it. So oh, I have really some cool. classical musicians who have offered to um, play the music if I write it and send it to them, and then they will record it. Uh, and so we won't even be in the same facility together, but we will work on this project together. And they've already sent me some samples of what you know what their instruments sound like, you know, and you know, how they like to work. So I think it's going to work out well. And I'm going to end up writing some classical music, which I do do classical piano. Um, I know most people up here know me because of a rock band, but I was tra classically trained. So it's kind of going back to my roots and it feels good. I was actually a resident composer at the University of Washington at one time, but that was at the computer music center uh, with uh, electronic and computer music. But this is going back to my roots. I'm working with woodwinds and flutes and it feels really good because I, I listened to all these different musical instruments and the ones that evoked the feeling that I have right now and that it seems like a lot of people around me have were woodwinds and flutes because it's a very evocative and kind of heartfelt and subtle and beautiful kind of sound. And, and so that's what I'm going to be working on. And also, you know, I have several books that I've been trying to finish. So here we go. I'm not going out. I'm definitely not meeting with my friends at the rock clubs in Seattle are going to all these amazing art gallery openings, you know, with all my friends. Um, we are all, all of us, artists, musicians, journalists, writers, staying at home. And if we don't have essential jobs that require us to be out in the public, we are at home and rethinking a lot of things and probably kind of reshaping our lives in a lot of ways that wouldn't have, have happened otherwise. I'm going to have other people on the call who have more reflections. No, oh, I just want to go back. It's so important, Mark, that, um, you know, that re reflecting on one's life, um, you know, I think it's, it's going to change this country in a good way, I hope. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, Mark, uh, I've seen homeless people out there as well, and I'm a little concerned about what's being done for them near in Pennsylvania. And, you know, to your point about people trying to find alternative ways of doing things, um, 
virtual reality is really taking off. Um, Alt Space VR, for instance, is getting uh, you know, basically uh, bombarded by new users. So people are you know, looking at alternatives like virtual reality you know, to meet do you think it's um, interesting in that um, one of the big game companies out there that you know, is in the virtual reality game space, um, Unity, uh, is now offering free classes every single day, um, 9 a.m. Pacific time and yes, I think it's 5 p.m. Pacific time. I, I'm, I take the later class, so, so it's 8 eight or nine eight eastern time eight eastern time here unity is offering these uh, amazing classes on game design so yeah i mean it's uh it's, you know people are coming together virtually um which is great because i think this has really been the catalyst that virtual space or um, you know, messaging, whatever one wants to call it, hasn't had. And so now we've had to, you know, retract, be in our houses and be functional. And so people are, you know, unfortunately, we're also overloading the internet. And, you know, we're going to see some issues there, I think, because everyone's at home now. On John, this is, this is Dean. I, I, I do have a follow up on that and I, I'm in the process of, of trying to put something together on this a while back about a week and a half ago we but had a can failure I interrupt? of can I interrupt? Yes. that was John Harvey that, by the way that was John Harvey in Pittsburgh and this is Dean Edwards in, in um, Salem Oregon go ahead Dean yes yes John is our chief international correspondent and chief information officer uh, I'm the president and international coordinating editor for Democracy Watch News, also one of the co one of the news anchors here. And as Mark said, I'm in Salem, Oregon. There was an interesting development, as some people might be aware, Bend, Oregon, Deschutes County, Oregon, is one of the hubs for the Internet. It used to be down in Silicon Valley, but no more. It's The server farms are located up here in Oregon, and there's some concern that I have raised about the health of the technicians who... Uh, maintain those servers, and I've heard nothing back on this yet. Uh, this was raised by a couple of events. One, it's at Cal State San Marcos in California in San Diego County, where servers went down because people weren't showing up to maintain them. Uh, and that, that and other events caused uh, some facilities in Georgia to have some of their technicians take in residency so that they to make sure that, that they were able to maintain some of the critical infrastructure. I don't know if that was specifically IT, but it's related. This is, should be something that people are paying attention to, and we are monitoring this situation. We'll be having reports on it. Uh, those will probably be most available at DWatch News and our regional services. So if you go on Facebook.com slash DWatch News and Twitter.com slash eWatch News for Democracy Watch News. You'll see that between our international information and with, uh, with, with references to our more regional services and the work that our engagement editor, Lynn Edwards, my wife, uh, is doing in Facebook, hopefully we'll keep people up to date on trending information. What we're trying to do here at Democracy Watch News is pull together the global dialogue. It doesn't matter whether you're liberal or conservative or anarchist or libertarian or Marxist or cons or whatever. Uh, if you're committed to self-governance and maintaining the common good from your perspective, that's all we ask. And if you can engage in that kind of civil discourse, then welcome, and we will try to give voice to your concerns and your reports. Uh, we are working around the clock here at Democracy Watch News to make this happen. It is our purpose. 
and we will continue to do so. And today, for instance, we were joined on this call by people from India uh, who are working with Brigadier uh, Sir Sawant in Mumbai. And I want to thank the Brigadier for sending them to us. Uh, I've been in contact with uh, uh, with our friend Rami in uh, in Lyon, France, who's going to be doing some work with us there. Um, our international correspondent for Africa, Europe, and the Middle East uh, is moving to Brussels. So Samuel Hina will be uh, joining us from time to time. We will continue to uh, forward reports from Aisha Dabo, our engagement editor for Sub-Saharan Africa. That great work that she's doing there with the Afractivist, who are her main source of occupation right now. And it goes on from there. I could keep going, but we got to keep this brief. We will continue to bring you your reports. I want to thank you all for joining us and stand by for more updates. Meanwhile, I want to thank Mark Taylor Canfield for moving in and becoming co-anchor to the, uh, this work. Mark uh, brings considerable skill with news production uh, as well as reporting. And uh, Mark, you'll find Mark also on the Bill Hartman Show uh, regularly and even more regular every Tuesday you'll find him on the Jeff Santos show and I encourage people to go to tune in radio or elsewhere and uh, find those shows they're well worth listening to and Jeff Santos is a good picture of what it means to be a social liberal here in the United States uh, Jeff uh, that's his audience he does a real good digest of that and it's something new to the United States we are usually right of center but we were this country is changing and Jeff is giving the best reporting on that that one could ask for. And Mark is a regular part of that. So back to you, Mark. Thank you, Dean. And there were, there were a couple of things I wanted to mention here. It is really interesting to hear John talk about VR, which is something that, you know, he's, he's talked with us about before. Um, because it leads to all these different issues that we have talked about in the past. Um, where are we going? These are futuristic sort of issues about robotics, you know, which we've discussed, um, AI, VR. What is their role uh, during a time like this? And I think, you know, we will find that, that, that they do have um, direct roles, and John was reporting that they do. One thing that I should mention is that as far as artificial intelligence is concerned, there are uh, complaints, you know, because, and this relates to Dean's comments about the technicians too, they are having complaints on some of the social networking platforms because the human personnel were not working and not monitoring the social networks that AI algorithms took over and started um, deleting people's messages that they considered against community standards. And then, of course, later, uh, some of these social networks had to apologize because they realized that um, the AI is just not up to just not now in order, in order to do the things that some humans would be doing on uh, Facebook, Twitter, platforms like that. I mean, let's face it, politics is a very subtle human thing. Most most humans don't even understand politics <laughs> because it's so complex and and uh, human oriented. But um, I wanted to mention that and also. Um, Another shout out to, I know that in Seattle, there are free markets. Um, there are groups like Food Not Bombs that have been distributing food in Seattle for decades, free of charge to homeless folks and poor working folks. So uh, they are continuing to do this and they are also heroes. Once again, they're like soldiers putting themselves on the line. They're out there taking chances with their own help because they believe that the community needs to be served. And if they weren't there, no one would do it, which is, I guess, the very definition of what an essential service is. There's nobody else that can take your place, and it's a service that's really vital to the community. So they know that if they weren't um, having food banks and food distribution right now, that people would be going hungry. And that is true, especially considering that a lot of people are not working. So shout out to those people as well. I mean, these are the kinds of things that you see around the world at refugee camps and, you know, um, humanitarian centers, you know, where people are sacrificing their own time and their own, you know, self benefit in order to help other folks. The other thing, you know, and that goes for all the first responders and medical workers and people working in the pharmacies and the drug stores. You know, it's just amazing. I have friends who work in the service industry, some of these grocery stores and stuff, and they are some of the most important people in our community right now. And I hope that no one forgets that. And I hope that. 
after this is all over, they all get huge raises and get amazing benefits and great job security. A lot of they people are homeless, but they got time to they got time to shop. They're shopping online. Yeah, it's gonna be crazy. Yeah, it's a, it's a job. There's there's also this idea, and this is probably you know we should probably wrap this up soon, but there is a um, a political side to this, which I tried to avoid in my recent reports. I would only mention this in op-ed pieces or editorials because it is a time when it's best to be no-nonsense and proactive and aggressive in dealing with all these issues and there's really no time for for bullshit i mean this is a time for people to be serious mark mark, get, mark uh sorry i you know <laughs> you just jogged my my memory and and i agree i mean we shouldn't be putting this into but anyway, did anyone else get a postcard that says this is Trump plan for, you know, how to handle COVID-19? No. 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 Okay, so um, there's a postcard that I got. I actually got two of them. It says Trump's plan, not the U.S. government's plan or the CDC's plan, but Trump's plan. And it's just craziness. And, and and he continues to blast out, you know, donate money for this. Um, you know, you can meet me here, whatever. It, it's 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 garbage. I'm sorry. Sorry, sir. Uh, okay. Yeah, the, John, yeah. If, if I could, if I could, uh, this is Dean in um, Edwards in Salem, Oregon. Uh, there is a. Uh, Seeing, as in the word seeing, S-E-E-I-N-G, A-I, capital A-I, and that is an app that's out for developing um, augmented uh, reality and virtual reality. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in, you'll find it listed under, under photography and video and such things in the, in the, in your local Play Store or App Store. Um, and that's something that's pretty hot right now, and I'm recommending people take a look at that and see if it's of any use to them. Unseen? Seeing. As in, I am seeing the, the fish swim in the sea. S-E-E-I-N-G-A-I. Getting a lot of good reviews. Well, I have a direct response to Don. Okay, so I just checked my mail, and guess what? President Trump's Coronavirus Guidelines for America. And this is a... It's got the White House logo on it, a CDC logo. And then it says, for more information, please visit coronavirus.gov. And it says March 16th, 2020. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, I do have that. And in general, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of reading it as I talk to you. In general, it's pretty much very similar to some of the things that um, Governor Inslee was saying. Yeah, that no, I haven't it's good information and good stuff. It's just, you know, it, it's. You know, just once again, it's about Trump. It's not about the country yeah. or anything else. It's like, well, these are my recommendations, you know, Trump's recommendations. Yeah. It's bullshit. You know, well, you're just total to that bullshit. You interjected just as I was headed in that direction, John. Because <laughs> I was trying to give everyone a disclaimer to say that, I, you know, this is... You know, the coronavirus is going to affect everyone regardless of your politics. But there are people in politics who have our, our best interests in mind, and then there are folks who you might want to question that. And and unfortunately, you know, Trump is acting more and more like a dictator. Um, he's bringing his own personal political career into it by saying in his tweet that, um, you know, the Democrats are against him because they don't want him to get reelected, and that's why they're trying to slow down the economy. So you understand the conspiracy theory here is that, you know, he's, he was the one who claimed it was a hoax at one point. So that's what we're dealing with. The guy acts like a dictator more and more. Everything is about him. So I understand your feeling about that. I have a similar feeling. And I did mention that. And, and Mark, Mark if, if for those people who go on Twitter, if they will go to dwatchnews underscore NAM for North America and click on list. There's a particular list that we maintain called GOP for Grand Old Party, GOP Resistance. And that list is full of 
tweets from present and former members of the Republican Party who are very active in this anti-fascist resistance movement. People like Bill Kristol and Rick Wilson and others uh, are, are prominently in there. And uh, Professor Painter from Minnesota. So GOP resistance, it's a, it's a list in DWatch News underscore NAM on Twitter. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I will try to make sure when we uh, edit this to to make sure that I mention the Twitter feed and stuff right up front at the beginning of this podcast because I know there's a lot of people out there that are out there, a lot of people out there right now. There are a lot of people out there right now who are hungry for for good information, and it's difficult to sift through, of course, what's online because there's there is a lot of um, inaccurate information. There's also you know a corporate controlled media that on the one hand is doing a good job of getting information out, you know, way, way behind, you know, way behind where they should have been. I mean, this should have been something they were talking about last year, but, um, but at the same time, there's also sort of an exploitative um, response sometimes where scaring people is increasing their ratings. So there's a fine line there. There's also, unfortunately, people who are exploiting people by doing price, uh, by doing price gouging, there are also other people doing scams right now. And unfortunately, you know, put that aside, but even the political side of this, it, it does point out what you might want to call, you know, like the, the nastier side of capitalism at some point. And it shows the weaknesses and the vulnerability of a purely capitalistic system. Whereas, you know, it's just something that Dean has mentioned before, whereas a mixed economy uh, would have been probably, you know, a, much more prepared to respond to something like this. And I don't want to go into details of the whole different discussion. If other people want to carry it, that's fine. But, you know, um, Senator Bernie Sanders and others have been calling for universal health care. You know, Canada has had universal health care, at least in Saskatchewan, since 1947 with um, Tommy Douglas and that whole movement. Um, when I talked to our Jim McDermott, 14-term congressman here in Washington State, he literally used... Uh, uh, profanity, expletive deletes when I asked him about, you know, national health care. He just thinks it's ridiculous. It's something that he's been fighting for his entire life, and he doesn't understand how we've allowed uh, pharmaceuticals and insurance companies and, and the Republican Party and others and some of the Democratic Party to block it. Um, and so there is a political side to this. And just uh, as a as an afterthought, what I've noticed is that a lot of these issues that in the past would have been turned as, quote, socialism, unquote, are now just routine because the governments around the country are trying to take care of people. And how do you do that if you don't have this is This is where we put in a link for YouTube, the times they are a-changing. Go, Dylan. Yeah, I actually did a line or two of that um, on the Jeff Santos show the other day, Sunday, just for that reason, because it's so apropos. But, uh, you know, we're seeing the political, political sands shift quickly. We don't know, you know, and we, we learned in 2016 as journalists, you know, how wrong the media can get, get the politics in this country. But I really uh, do see, it is unavoidable to see that um, things like universal health care and um, subsidies for small businesses and education and artists, you know, all of this stuff, which is considering considered socialist and it's really a, considered objectionable to a lot of people on the right and, and libertarian type folks. It's actually what's happening right now. And it does happen during emergencies and it's what happened during the great depression. That's the other thing I've noticed is that, you know, li listening to governor Jay Inslee tell us about, you know, the stay at home order and trying to reassure everyone at the same time that he's sounding the alarm Reminded me a lot about, you know, of these old speeches and fireside chats you hear from FDR. And I'm noticing more and more of that. I noticed on the Jeff Santos show, he opened his show yesterday with a speech by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So suddenly FDR becomes the role model here because he was presiding at a time when our entire financial system was going under. And people, well, the banks were foreclosing on people's farms and homes and there was mass migration across the country. Um, the coal mines were closing down. It was just a huge, huge problem. And so he developed public works projects, um, created social security, um, did all sorts of things to keep people going in the meantime while the, while the 
the business people, you know, were losing it. I and, mean, you know, people were jump, jumping off of skyscrapers because the stock market had crashed. So at that point, people realized, you know, that, well, maybe big business doesn't have the answer. And I think we're seeing that now again. And sometimes, regardless of, you know, all of our um, worries about democracy when during civil emergency orders and our worries about, um, you know, the military, you know, getting involved in our communities and things like that on a daily basis. It's we are at a point where when you're in an emergency situation, uh, everybody has to work together, and somehow um, government actually starts to do the right thing sometimes during an emergency. Now, my point of view, just personally, in my editorial comment, is that these are things that the government should have been doing a long time ago. And, you know, obviously, if you do not have universal health care and you have a lot of homeless and poor and mentally ill folks out there who are not being tested and don't have access to health care, it risks it's a risk for all of us. And that is that sense of community and solidarity that I think has been lacking in this country where it's all about, you know, winner take all. You know, I got mine. Where's yours? That whole bling bling thing, you know, with the Donald Trump on the rich billionaire president and the Michael Bloomfields. You know, people are seeing through that now because actually I mentioned this myself, you know, while a lot of people are really concerned about their stock market portfolios and the the devalue of them. And I understand because a lot of folks have 401ks that are their retirement funds, you know. Um, But at the same time, you know, I think the majority of people out there in my part of the country are just trying to figure out where to get some toilet paper. So that's a time when we need people in government that we can trust to do the right thing and to try to help the people and to try to make sure that those government services are available. And I hope we learn something from this crisis and we don't um, just keep hacking away at the social net because without it, we're all at risk. And that was the message that was missing. And maybe that was the message that was missing, you know, partly with the Bernie Sanders campaign at one point. I think now he, he is acting more like a statesman than a politician. And he's actually his, campaign, by the way, is raising money for charity. They're not raising money for his campaign. So I should tell you something. Sometimes um, there are more important things in politics, and I'm glad to see that people are recognizing that. And I don't know if anybody else on the call... I mean, it's interesting you you say that. um, Yeah, let's hope. Let's hope. Well, it's definitely making some things seem much more apparent and clearer. It's really hard to to fight through the media disinformation campaigns and propaganda out there from the political parties to really see what's happening in your community and in your world because there's so many competing interests trying to get your attention. But at times like these, that doesn't count for much. Like, it doesn't really matter that Michael Bloomberg owns his own media uh, (laughs) empire. It really doesn't matter right now. Exactly, exactly. It's not really helping out the folks in my community. And that's what they're looking for. Everybody here is just looking for, for help right now to each other, too. The other thing we didn't mention is all over Seattle, especially, and it's very sad, actually, but all over Seattle, there are people who are unemployed right now, have no money, and they need help. And they're, um, so people, once again, what's your choice? You have to go online. So there are all sorts of fundraising efforts and people just putting up websites for their friends saying, you know, my friend Joe was working at the show box and, but, you know, my friend Julianne is out there. She's putting up posts for uh, one of the clubs where she works in Seattle, the music clubs that are closed and talking about how hard it is for her fellow employees to survive. Um, artist Julia Wald, who I've worked with before, she is doing a whole uh, art series and cartoon series right now about people suffering in Seattle from unemployment and all of the restaurant workers and club workers. So uh, there's a, also a sense of solidarity amongst workers that I hadn't seen before. You have NBA players that are donating hundreds of thousands of dollars to the workers at the arenas. That's, I mean, that's working class solidarity for, you know, from a guy who's probably got, you know, multi multi millions in the bank. So, it's a, it's a different thing that's happening, and uh, I just wanted to mention, too, that, yeah, there's a lot of people out there. Now, one thing we didn't mention, and this definitely would be a whole different call, but a whole different podcast, but, okay, so everybody's going online, great, but I hope somebody's thinking about the possibility that Dean kind of uh, refer, or kind of hinted at earlier about, yeah, 
but what if what if the net goes down? I hope people have some kind of idea of how to uh, meet with their friends at a public space or something, have find or find a tree that you can post notes to or something, because people are going to need to communicate. We had that and, when I lived in California. That was uh, running blackouts were a common thing, and so when they first started, I, I was working at Qualcomm, and you know we had thousands of employees just sitting there. All of a sudden, you know, they couldn't do anything because nothing worked. Um, yeah, we had backup power, but the backup power was to the servers and you know critical infrastructure, not the employees' desktop. So we came up with various things, but you know ultimately it's. Going back to the, you know, analog stuff, books, newspapers, magazines, and as you say, you know, taking a walk in the park, getting out. Um, technology is helping. Technology really is, you know, I think um, there's a lot of people that are stuck inside because they have to be stuck inside and through VR and various other things are managing to, you know, you've, I'm sure, seen uh, the news about, uh, you know, various kids using social media platforms to entertain elderly people in old age homes, that type of thing. And so, I mean, it's, it's great while it's, while it's up. But as you say, it goes down. But I hope you've got a, a bunch of good books to read. And gentlemen, um, we've just been um, followed recently by Covering Climate Now, which is a journalist consortium, and uh, they thought they just followed us, which is kind of an invitation from them. And so coveringclimatenow.org is a site we should look at and considering ways that we might uh, join them. It would probably involve us setting up an environmental desk to, uh, to handle such things, but uh, that's something to think about, John. Well, we've, we've yeah. talked before in the past about ham radio operators, you know, my father is one, so walkie-talkies, um, but, you know, it's interesting to study how people deal with things like that during natural disasters or times of war and things. Um, how do people communicate when there's a, a major uh refugee uh, immigration movement happening? How do people uh, communicate during famine and crisis? So those are things that I'm interested in. And I can only imagine that, you know, uh, you know, I'm thinking back to the town crier and the Revolutionary War and, you know, the, the committees of correspondence and people posting, you know, when we use the word post, just like when we use the word press to describe the media, it's because of the the presses that they use to press the um, the prints with the ink onto the paper. There's also this idea of posting. You know, we say, I'm going to post this at Facebook. Well, that's because people traditionally have a, a tree or pole or a wall in their community or in their town square where they post things. Everybody sees that at cafes in Seattle, um, especially when you're um, down on the water and around boat people. There's always, you know, boat for sale or whatever, looking for a sale or whatever. And so people are posting things, you know, on, on the, the bulletin board. In my high school, you know, we had the bulletin that was read every day over the intercom. So people will figure out ways of communicating. But it is important, regardless of whether electronic devices are available, to communicate information because it could be very important to you you know where to where they're giving out food where you can find medical treatment uh where to stay away from um what how you know public health issues to do you have to deal with you know things like that need to be communicated regardless and i hope that people just you know at least amongst their families have their emergency plans worked out so that there's some idea of like if we can't communicate we know a place we can meet or something 
there's a lot of things that, you know, people don't talk about very often in modern culture because we consider our technology to be somehow invulnerable, which it isn't. And uh, so there's things I'm thinking about, you know, back in, in, the, in the good old days, as they say, before the internet. Surprisingly enough, people still communicated every day. It was amazing how they did that. <laughs> of course, the problem was, and this is something that we don't have to face today, at least at this at the moment, is that when it takes six weeks or six months for information to travel to the appropriate people, you know, wars continue long after the truce has been called, you know, crazy things like that. So luckily we're not dealing with that lag time in history that people used to deal with where it might be a few years before they figure out that, you know, um, somebody discovered a new comment, you know, <laughs> or a new treatment for, you know, an illness or something. So luckily at least we have an advantage, but something that, well, another one, one more thing that wasn't mentioned before is that, and it's also apparent is that when you have international travel, you know, and, and John kind of mentioned this before, um, it does create health issues that you wouldn't normally have. So there you go. And it's a part of modern culture is that people are going to many different parts of the world and many of us know who travel <laughs> that if your uh, particular, um, uh, your particular synergy of, of, uh, of, you say bacteria and other microorganisms in your body doesn't agree with <laughs> the microorganisms in somebody else's food or water that you could have some major illnesses. And that's a part of traveling is, you know, often dealing with illness and adjusting um, to different kinds of foods, different kinds of environments. So imagine that you have a culture now where people are traveling internationally on a daily basis and um, introducing all sorts of interesting microorganisms and viruses into, you know, places that they've never been before. Um, so another reason why, um, in general, all the entire globe should be much more um, aware and educated and, and take precautions against things that are, I think, like, they're happening right now. There's, I mean, really, you know, there should have been enough surgical masks. There should have been enough latex gloves. And there should have been all of this stuff in a stockpile somewhere by the CDC or somebody, by government agencies. There should have been uh, a, a way to be prepared just in case something like this did happen. And the fact that, that we weren't really shows that, you know, maybe sometimes our priorities have been a bit skewed. And people are maybe a little bit more concerned about making money in the stock market than they are the public welfare. Did you have anything to contribute? And we do. We would like to uh, schedule some time with you so we could uh, we could interview you have, to that as whole board. Uh, you're speaking with Kate and Ray. Yes. Yeah, I have something. I have an input here right now after speaking. Uh, after listening to Mark, I have an input. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. So I'm working uh, in health domain. Uh, I'm a naturopath. And the one thing I realized that uh, there are not enough education, uh, any government or anybody providing to improve our immune system, what food we should eat. Uh, there, is, there is more focus on hygiene and the supplies or uh, where we can uh, cut down the infection and all that, but no one is speaking about uh, right food where we can improve on our immune system. So uh, there are many inputs I have, but I am limiting myself here uh, with this topic. I, I haven't seen any governments uh, talking about good food and most of the people are talking about viruses, they are bad and they are dangerous. But no one is speaking about improving our immune system, that is the lack in society. So I'm working in that domain uh, currently. I'm not sure how to respond to that. That's an international connection, so I'm just I'm glad we can hear you. As far as food, I think the main concern in my part of the United States is just that people have access to food at this point. 
and there have been some suggestions, even though the governor is saying do your regular shopping. Um, as far as nutrition, I don't have enough information on that myself, and I don't hear many people talking about that here either. One of the best things you can do is just in generally be healthy right now because you don't want um, to have another physical issue that you have to see medical people about because they're already busy. Two, um, you don't want to weaken yourself or you know not get enough good food or sleep, st- overstress yourself, those kinds of things because it does lead to illness and we don't want to overwhelm the medical facilities right now and we don't want to uh, weaken our immune system. So I would just say everybody should take extra caution to eat well, sleep, take it easy, don't stress yourself, you know, be healthy, eat nutritious food. But I am not a, a nutrition or health expert, which is why for the first week or so of this crisis, I really didn't do much reporting because I left it to the experts. You know, I am not a health expert. I've never done health, public health reporting before this issue, ever. So I, it's only now, like everyone else, I'm starting to learn by listening to the experts. And luckily there have been, um, my own congresswoman, Pramila Jayapal, had a town hall really early, like the first week of the outbreak here that she invited me on. And there have been other groups that have had medical professionals, online town halls and seminars and things, you know, trying to educate people. So education is also uh, another important part of this. Mark, just a quick comment on, um, you know, what you said there. And that is that, you know, I've been told that if a grocery store employee comes down with the virus, the whole grocery store it has to close. And so, you know, that could be a, a really bad situation. And, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about here in Pennsylvania is what the Swiss are doing, and I'm sure other people around the world, but starting to grow vegetables and things in one's own backyard. I mean, again, it goes back to my earlier comment about, you know, we, we're still going to see how this thing plays out. But... If it comes down to it, we need to you know, go back to basics. Check. There are community gardens in Seattle. A lot of the city parks have portions of it that are community gardens. One of the essential businesses that the governor and mayor designated in Seattle was the organic food co-op and the community garden because they have been distributing food before this to food banks and other places because so they're considered essential as far as um food um and sanitation now we had a pretty good presentation that we probably should have recorded and um and put as a out of podcast but lynn our engagement editor gave us a really good presentation on how to deal with groceries I am not a health professional. Just like when I talk about legal issues, you know, I have to give that disclaimer. I'm not an attorney. So, you know, don't take my advice as a professional. But when I come home from a store in Seattle in Martin Luther King Jr. County, which is an epicenter for this, I wash everything. And why wouldn't I? I don't know who's coughed on it. I don't know who's handled it, whether it's food or packaging or anything that I'm going to be touching myself. I kind of do what you call the decontamination process when I enter my apartment. So the shoes come off. I've not been in, um, not in medical labs like this, but I have been in physics labs that were clean rooms. And I don't do that, obviously, when I come home, but I do take out my shoes, you know, which we talked about before, which I've always done. But also, I put the clothes off, the jacket that I'm wearing, the gloves that I'm wearing, Whatever I'm at, I'm there. I, I take that off by the door so it stays in its own new location. And then I wash the gloves, you know, with, with some kind of soap or if I have it, some kind of antibacterial soap. And then, you know, of course, wash my hands and then wash everything that I bought. Because I know that any packaging or any food, you know, could have some contamination. And maybe it's not even COVID. Maybe it's just somebody has a 
cold or something, you know, and they hopped on it. Or, you know, we talked about this last time. People pick up vegetables, they squeeze it, they look at it, they put it back down. Yep. In the grocery stores, in Seattle at least, for a long time, there have been hand sanitation stations right next to the to the shopping carts. And I think that started a couple of years ago during other flu outbreaks and things and colds, you know, because in Seattle, a lot of times in the winter and fall here where it just this rains and it's kind of damp for months. And so some people get uh, respiratory issues. And so that's been going on for a long time. But yeah, in terms of, you know, food, like whenever I've gone to, uh, even when I buy organic food, I tend to wash it. And I've worked in food service myself. But, you know, I used to pick strawberries as a teenager and do agricultural work and work on farms and stuff. And sometimes you drop things in the dirt and you just kind of throw it back in there. It happens. So best to just wash your food. And then, you know, I would have to leave that up to biologists or health professionals on exactly how you should wash it. But there's all sorts of sanitation things about home stuff, you know, that have come out because of COVID. And it has to do with the fact that even when you're cleaning things, you know, the very things that you're cleaning your environment with could contaminate you. So you need to get rid of them. I mean, you know, there's something that most people don't or not are not aware of is that um, ultraviolet C, um, and I, do, I don't remember what the nanometer um, spectrum is, but it kills viruses. And, you know, one of the things that I actually bought before this happened is something called a phone soap, which is a little box that has the ultraviolet bulbs in it, and you put your cell phone in there for 10 minutes, and it basically zaps all viruses on the phone. So, you know, I think, you know, we're, we're going to be, people are going to be becoming more educated regarding these things. And, you know, you'll mention of the toothbrush. Um, there's actually a, a, a UVC toothbrush um, sterilizer that you can get where you put your toothbrush in and, you know, close the lid and the light goes on and it kills everything and you take it out and you've got a germ-free toothbrush. But, you know, it, it can also become very obsessive for some people and, you know, kind of like the, the I don't know if anybody's seen that movie with John Travolta when he was a kid or whatever, The Boy in the Plastic Bubble or whatever. I mean, people who do have immune issues and allergies know a lot of this already. Lynn, you know, obviously knows a lot about it. I actually had a lot of allergies when I was a kid. I, you know, couldn't have a Christmas tree and all that because I had um, tested positive to so many things like dog hair. And I mean, I live in Washington state and I was allergic to evergreen trees. So I couldn't figure out whenever I went to somebody's house that had a Christmas tree, I'd get sick. You know, my nose would plug up and I'd feel terrible. Well, that's a problem and, here in Pennsylvania too now. You know, spring is here, and so people have allergies, and you know, how to differentiate between the virus and allergies. I now no longer have those allergies. I, I grew out of them, as they say, so I don't get hay fever. I'm not allergic to evergreen trees. Oh, it's just in here. That, yeah, that's an interesting totally point you said, sir. Uh, I have an input here, and it, it's an interesting input. Uh, you would like to hear that. This is Ketan here from India. Uh, I, I'm, am I audible? Am I clearly audible? Yes, you sound you sound very good here in Salem. Um, to me, good. you're very clear. However, good. remember, I'm a friend of Dr. Takre in Nagpur, and so I'm very oh. used to the Marathi accent. <laughs> oh, my God. Thank you so much. Got you. I helped him so, uh, his PhD thesis back in college, so I've known him a long time. But it's great to have yeah. you join us. I know it's late for you, it's, but we, uh, I'm up late. When I talk to the brigadier, it's usually 1 o'clock in the morning here. So, Yeah. So uh, recently I've been uh, uh, working on my brigadier's uh, diabetes. Uh, since last almost a week, uh, he is not on medication, and his diabetes is uh, diabetes uh, levels are coming normal. I had been weak all my uh, life. I am 36 now, 
and that was the reason i took interest in health and i realized the power of good food, nutritious food if we could eat a good raw food or healthy food that creates a good healthy bacteria uh, healthy bacteria and healthy bacterial colony and uh, i don't want to barge into this topic right now uh, but this is the brief i can actually uh, share with you thank you i appreciate that most welcome thank you there, there's something else that uh, that came up uh, this morning dr fauci well respected around the world with his centers for disease control was saying and they just reminded me of this dr gupta is going to comment on an on uh MSNBC right now but uh this could become a seasonal thing unless you if you have people coming from the 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 global south into the north global north i mean i'm talking about the equator here um uh, they will be bringing um their winter uh season with them and that that can cause some situations so we we may see uh this thing repeat itself seasonally um also there are, there are indications in australia that uh, in warmer weather uh we could see see problems um uh continuing uh i'm really curious what the temperature is in mumbai right now uh you know how is that uh, relating to is it like is it in the 20s or uh, on centigrade scale or is it higher because that may put to rest some of the belief that this is going to go away in the summertime we don't know that that's pure guesswork and also you are right you are absolutely correct the quality of the food that we put into our bodies the more we pay attention to to maintaining good nutrition that gives our body the building blocks it they need to to be strong and healthy and have active immune systems check you have been listening to democracy cast from democracy watch news Democracy Cast is available wherever you access your podcasts. You can also hear it at TuneIn Radio. You can follow Democracy Watch News at Facebook and subscribe to our international news feeds at Twitter. Check out the website where you'll find links to our podcasts and blogs. democracywatchnews.org. Special thanks to Steve Barnes, Sally Gellert, and John Harvey for technical assistance. The Democracy Cast theme was composed by Mark Taylor Canfield. Thanks for listening.